one thing that is an obstacle for people's transcendent connection is that they are so weighed down by things that to me, in my orderly, rigid way, I'm like, you can get rid of that. Hello and welcome to this special series of The Sacred, themed around the book I have just launched, Fully Alive. This series, we're still trying to get to our guests' deep values and principles, but we're shaking it up a little bit by doing that through the lens of asking them what fully aliveness means to them. And one of the ways I explore this theme in the book is through the potentially quite controversial lens of sin, by which I mean disconnection. Every episode, I am reflecting on one of the seven deadly sins as a way of thinking about the different ways we disconnect. And in this episode, I was looking for someone to help me think through the idea of acedia, more commonly known as sloth. And we think of sloth as laziness, but acedia, acedia is more uh, richer than that, more complex. Uh, it has listlessness in it and apathy. Distraction is a really uh, central thing, failing to attend to what's important. And so I spoke to someone who has spent much of her career thinking about how to live an intentional life and more recently specifically about this idea of attention, Gretchen Rubin. She has written many, many internationally best-selling books, most famously The Happiness Project and Better Than Before, which was one of those, one of the groundbreaking early books on the power of habit. Her most recent book, Life in Five Senses, really looks at how our senses can ground us in the moment and help us pay attention to the world. And so I really enjoyed reflecting on this theme with her. We spoke about her love of children's literature, which I share, why St. Therese of Lisieux is her spiritual teacher, and why we might need a seminary for accidental spiritual gurus. I hope you enjoy listening. Gretchen, we are going to go deep fast and uh, we are doing a special series of this podcast. We're very interested in people's values and I will get to that in a moment. But first, I want to ask you what fully aliveness means to you. I think you might have thought about this a bit more than your average person. No, a a absolutely. And I, I recently wrote a book called Life in Five Senses uh, because being fully alive to me means being awake to the moment. And I realized that I have a real tendency to just march around, you know, distracted, stuck in my head. And to be fully alive means to, you know, notice a, a passing scent or a distant sound or the feeling of the wind on my face. But I have, as I say, my inclination is to ignore all those things. So I have to work very hard to um, stay in the moment. That's really helpful. And I'm sure we'll come back to it. But I'm, as I said, I'm fascinated in people's values. We often ask what is sacred to someone, but we're really trying to just dig for people's deep principles. I know you have a kind of personal manifesto, you know, 12 personal commandments. If you had to boil it down to some really key principles that you try and live by, what would they be? That's such a good question. And I think it's something to ask ourselves over and over. But if I had to pick like the core values, I think one is integrity. And for me, integrity means I think what we often think of as being like truthful with other people and upholding our values, but also knowing yourself. I think that integrity for me means like, who is Gretchen? What does it mean to be Gretchen? That's one of my 12 personal commandments. So being true to myself as well as being true to other people. Um, one is compassion. So I think always asking ourselves, like, how do other people see things? What are other people's experiences? How do I misunderstand how someone else could see a situation? Um, because so often I realize, I think that I'm in an objective, I see things objectively and I absolutely do not see things objectively. I'm always coming from my own perspective. So compassion is realizing how much I need to think about how other people might be coming to it and understanding their experience. And then finally is a thirst for knowledge. I just feel like just wanting to learn and which again goes to compassion, wanting to expand my understanding, you know, um, whether that's like scientific research or human nature, um, just trying to constantly notice the obvious. I think it's very hard to notice what's happening right in front of us. So I spend a lot of time trying to just think about the ordinary day and the ordinary exchange and sort of ordinary things happening around me. Yes, that's so beautiful. And I think that really does come through in your most recent book that that um, the beauty and the dignity and the value and the holiness really of, of, of our ordinary lives and um, 
how we can kind of make holy, make sacred the things around them with, with the power of our attention. Yes. I wonder if, if there have been moments in your life, either with that one or with some of your other values where you've had to really use a deep value to make a decision because I have a, th- a working theory that we don't really know what our deep sacred values are until they feel threatened, until we're invited to compromise on them maybe, or you know, we could take one path in life that would not involve staying loyal to our values. Does anything bubble up for you, moments in your life where you've had to choose to live by your values or maybe failed to, as we all do? Um, well, there's one that sticks out very much and I'm not, and I didn't list it as one of my values. So here's another value cropping up. Um, so one of my sort of uh, mottos for myself is to choose the bigger life. Whenever I can't make a decision, I, I think to myself, well, which decision represents the bigger life? And it's funny, what I found is over and over, you can have kind of your pros and your cons list equally balanced. But if you say, well, which one represents the bigger life? It's very clear which one is the right answer. So this came up for me because I have two daughters and they so wanted a dog. They were begging for a dog and they were big kids, like they were teenagers. And so we hadn't had a dog for a long time. And my husband was like, yeah, we can get a dog. That's fine with me. Um, but for me, I was like, well, I know all the happiness research says that getting a dog is, makes you happier and healthier. And I had a dog growing up and I love my dog, but it means... It's so much effort and inconvenience. I like, I dislike doing errands. It's like, you know, it's, you can't go away on a trip. Like it's just this whole other thing to worry about. And I thought, oh, I just don't want all that hassle. And so to me, the pros and cons felt very balanced and it was, I just couldn't make a decision because, you know, you get a dog, it's a big commitment. I was like, we might live with this dog longer than we lived with either of our daughters. I mean, you know, it's, it felt like a really, really big commitment. But then finally, I remembered to ask myself, well, choose the bigger life. And while I think for some people, a bigger life would be not having a dog because they could use that time and energy and money in other ways that might be more valuable to them at this season in their life. Maybe they'd get a dog at another time. But for right now, the bigger life was not having a dog. It was 100% clear to me that in my family, in our situation, the bigger life was to get the dog. And we got the dog. And of course, I'm so happy we got the dog. Our dog Barnaby added so much to our lives. I can't believe that I was on the fence. Um, But really having that kind of core idea to choose the bigger life was what allowed me to move forward. Because, you know, it's always easier to not, to, to just stick with the status quo. So I'm not sure that we would have gotten a dog if that hadn't occurred to me. That's so beautiful. You alluded to having a dog when you were growing up. I would love to hear a bit more about your childhood and particularly the big ideas that were in the air as you were running around. Religious, political, philosophical, probably unspoken rather than explicit, but what were the things that were forming you? I had sort of a very typical childhood, you know, uh, two parents. I have a sister who's five years younger than I am and a dog. Um, I lived in Kansas City, Missouri, which is right in the middle of the United States and in sort of a suburban house. So very much what if you were just sort of thinking of like stereotypical childhood, that was my experience. So I guess there really is no stereotypical childhood, but it felt it's, it was, you know, a sister, two parents, a dog. Uh, We didn't have a a fence, a white picket fence, but sort of, it wouldn't have been out of place. Um, Sort of the overwhelming thing that I think about from my childhood is just my intense love of reading. Um, I just, from the very first, I was, I was late learning how to read, um, but the minute I started, I just couldn't stop. Um, I, many of my happiest memories involve going to the library every week. Um, we were never allowed to buy books unless we were like going on a long car trip. And that was always really exciting. I remember that going to the bookstore, getting to pick my stack of books. Um, I still have, as an adult, I have a real love of children's literature and young adult literature. And I'm actually in two book groups with other adults where we talk about children's literature and young adult literature, um, because some adults have a taste for it, just the way some adults have a taste for mysteries and thrillers. So I think this love of reading was a was just pervaded my childhood and and uh, really shaped just my just my intellectual life and my, my the life of my imagination. And I, I loved that feeling that there was this adult world of culture and experience that. I I was groping my way toward that I would, you know, that it it felt mysterious and enticing. And um, so gave me a real, a a real feeling that 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 was a world that one day I could join. Um, And it gave kind of a magic to books that I I don't really have now as an adult. I don't have that sense of, 
of, um, you know, one day all this, I'll, I'll, I'll be part of this. Um, cause I am part of it, which is great, but it, there was, there was just a, a really, um, a real quality to reading those books as a child. Yes. I, uh, it, it, lots of things making sense now. I have a, a series on my Substack called What Children's Stories Tell Us About Our Values, where I go back to yes. the most beloved children's books. And I, I say, what, what, when we're trying to work out what our values are and the things we want to define our life, it, it, can, be, it can be quite hard as an adult, right? In the, th- in the thick of life and achievement yes. and pressure. But when you're a child, when you're, you put it so beautifully, slightly, slightly outside the adult world, the kind of life that you long to live is really at the surface. And it, yes, the, the things that we are drawn to in books, I think is really good data about ourselves. And for me, it was all about adventure and particularly like self-sacrificial love, people who could, you know, lay down their life for their friends. And it's everywhere in children's literature, that heroic, you know, the Frodo thing, a Harry Potter thing. My favorite children's book is called The Mouse Old Cat about this sailor who goes out to sea to find fish for his village that's starving and makes friends with the storm cat. You know, those themes just uh, yes. speak to our hearts. Do, do you have a sense of the ones that you loved, what, like why you loved what you loved? Uh, well, it's interesting because I like a, a theme that's related to your theme, which is the child earning for the for the family. So books like Ballet Shoes, where the child um, finds a way to contribute, or or books where the children are sort of have to survive, like the Boxcar Children. Um, Ah, oh, gosh. I mean, I just, I, I think in, maybe you're the same way. One of the things I really enjoy about children's literature is especially more traditional children's literature is it does tend to be quite didactic. And I, for, I like didactic fiction. Um, and so that really appeals to me. Um, I think people feel like they can do that a bit more. Um, in children's literature. And I always say to adults, like if you haven't, there's such great masterpieces in children's literature. If you at all have a taste for it, you know, go back to it, reread it or read what's new because, you know, we've gone through this golden age of children's literature. And there's so much amazing children's literature that has been written, you know, since, well, since I was an adult that, um, you know, I wish more people tapped into it because I do think that it's, it's a it's it's a kind of literature that stands on its own. And what is the difference between children's literature and young adult literature and adult literature is something that is very hard to put your finger on. Um, I'm not sure it's always clear. And some books move back and forth um, in their sort of in the way that they're viewed. Um, but I think you're right. One of it is that it it sort of it reveals our values in a different way and sometimes a more explicit way. Yes. I, I speak to a lot of writers and they often have this beautiful thing of talking about books and words and imaginative worlds in their childhoods, but you didn't follow a direct line to your, to writing being your life. You were a lawyer first. What, what, what led you into that profession initially? Well, looking back, I did everything that you would do to prepare yourself for, to be a writer. You know, I majored in English. I always would write papers instead of taking tests if I could choose. As a child, I had, and I still have them in my office right now, right above my head is these blank books where I would write down all quotations that I love from books that I was reading. But, you know, I went to law school for all the wrong reasons. I was like, well, I'm good at research and writing and it's a good preparation. It's great education. I can always change my mind later. This will, you know, keep my options open. My father is a lawyer. He really likes it. So I just drifted into law because I didn't know what else to do with myself. And I'm very glad that I did. It, you know, in the end, I had a, a, a terrific experience and I'm really glad that I that I did start my career in law and it, it, it shapes my writing to this day. It didn't even occur to me to want to be a writer because I thought of it as a writer as someone who wrote like novels or plays or poems, which I didn't want to do. Uh, somebody who was a journalist, which I did not want to do, or someone who was sort of an academic writer who, you know, was sort of writing, you know, kind of like a PhD type type thing, um, or a sort of a scholarly biography, and I didn't want to do that kind of thing. So I didn't, it didn't even occur to me, um, you know, the idea of sort of creative nonfiction, which now is you know, so widely accepted, you don't even think of it as a, as a category. Um, I just, I didn't really see that for myself. So it took me a while before I, I had an idea that was the kind of thing that I could write. Um, when, and that happened when I was a lawyer. So, um, that's, that's how I made the switch is I, I finally had an idea that made me realize, um, Hey, maybe there's a book I want to write and I could be the person who could write that book. How, scary or painful was it as a transition? Did you have to work up to it? 
You know, that's a great question. And looking back, it wasn't as scary as probably it should have been. Um, Hmm. One of the things is I started, my first book was called Power, Money, Fame, Sex, A User's Guide. And I started researching it and doing like all the note taking while I was still working. So I had done all this work. And then I went to the bookstore and got a book called something like How to Write and Sell Your Nonfiction Book Proposal. I just started following the directions. And um, I thought, you know, at a certain point, it occurred to me, well, you know, I'd rather fail as a writer than succeed as a lawyer at this point. So I I really need to take a shot. I need to either fail as a writer or make it as a writer. You know, I need to just give it a shot. And um, my husband and I were moving from uh, Washington, D.C. to New York. So so there was sort of this obvious break where it's like, well, am I going to get another job in law or am I going to really make this sort of my central work concern to get an agent. That was what I needed to do at that point was to get it, which by far, which is the hardest part of um, becoming a writer is to get an agent. Um, and, but I was very fortunate in two ways. One was that often when people are making a transition, they know where they want to leave, but they don't know where they want to go. So they're like, I know I don't want to do this, but what am I going to do next? That is the big mystery. And that that is an extremely difficult and often um, painful question to confront. But for me, I wanted to write this book. It wasn't that I even wanted to be a writer. I'm like, I want to write this specific book. And I've already taken hundreds of pages of notes. So so I felt something pulling me toward it. And it was very specific. So I think that made the transition much easier. And it was also easier for me because everyone around me was very supportive and encouraging of the idea that I was going to make this big transition and I was going to try something. And now that I'm a parent myself, I realize how remarkable this is because I think as parents, we often, we want our children to be safe. We don't want them to risk failure. We don't want them to feel rejection. Um, We want them to like stay on the path of sort of most obvious success. Um, And so I think it can be hard sometimes uh, to be encouraging when somebody's like, I'm going to throw everything away and start something new. Um, and my parents were very much like, okay, let's, you know, exciting. What, what, what are you going to do next? And, um, and my husband was also making a big switch. We met in law school. He was in law and he decided he wanted to switch out of law too. So he was switching into the world of finance. And so it was kind of nice that the people around me were supportive. And you went on to write several other books, um, uh, biographies and other things. And then the one that people think of as kind of your breakthrough book, The Happiness Project. And I've heard you talk about kind of happiness as your theme, you know, the thing that you're working away at and you've written about the way external order affects our happiness and our habits affect our happiness and our kind of tendencies and the way we're motivated affect our habits. And I'm going to do a terrible, terrible thing, which I've always done. I've already done to you slightly by asking you to boil down your values, which is which is to ask, and it will change, I'm sure, depending on what you're thinking about, but to ask if you had only one piece of wisdom to impart to someone who said, Gretchen, tell me what you, you know about happiness, and you were only allowed to say one key thing, what would it be? So usually I dodge this by giving two. I say, you could say this or you could say that, but you're really pushing me to pick one. I will will have lots of grace for you, but follow your heart. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Well, this is, I would say there's two ways you could answer this with one answer. There's sort of two ruse. One is if you were going to say, what is the one element of of life that is the most important for happiness? I would say relationships that ancient philosophers and contemporary scientists agree that to, to be happy, we have to have strong, enduring relationships. We need to feel like we belong. We need to be able to confide. We need to be able to give and get support. Um, and when you ask people who work, uh, if they're happy, it's, it's people who say, I have a friend at work or my manager really cares about me. Um, if you look at the people who say they're happy in life, they're people who have a lot, who say they have a lot of deep relationships. So anything that we do to broaden or deepen our relationships, you know, anything, any way that we're using our time, energy, or money towards relationships is something that is very almost certain to make us happier. So that's one answer. But you could also approach this question in a very different way. And you could say, well, the key to happiness is self-knowledge because the only way that we can build a happy life is on the foundation of our own nature, our own temperament, our own values, as we were just talking, our own values is such an important thing. Am I living up to my own values? Do I know my own values? Have I done enough self-reflection to to shape my life, to reflect me, not just some boilerplate, you know, set of expectations that I'm getting from other people. You know, we need to accept ourselves and also expect more from ourselves. And only we can understand, you know, those things that are intention. 
And so on the, I, I would say answer A is, is relationships and answer B is self-knowledge. They're both right, but they're, they are sort of different approaches to that, that central question. Yes, and I suppose they're, they're somewhat indivisible, aren't they? Because knowing ourselves helps us be better friends, parents, um, absolutely, colleagues. absolutely. Well, that's true. I hadn't thought of that. Maybe I, I will say there, there's one answer, but there's like an extremely important subset within that answer. That's how I'll dodge, dodge it next time to get to just one <laughs> big you. answer. Okay. So you're yeah. thinking like a lawyer. Yes. Uh, good. That's uh, not something that's often <laughs> said to me, I'll be honest. Um, which sort of brings me on to my next thing, really, which I... I, I having having met you, I'm I'm less worried about asking this question because I can I I, th- I think it w- I think it will make sense to you. But I I have a bit of a confession, which is that I feel I I feel like I can see a, quite a transition between your previous books and this one. And I've you know done a bit of a deep dive and listened to lots of podcasts and and read your earlier books, all of which I I, I knew a bit of, and I came so I thought, yep, helpful practical, you know, very applicable, very accessible stuff about habits and how to live and how we make choices and how we're disciplined, you know, completely useful stuff. But I didn't feel a deep connection with it. Partly, I think, because you and I are quite different. And part of the project of this podcast is having conversations across difference. And I, I'm pro-different. I love difference. Right? I find people different from me very fascinating and I want them in my life. But you say again and again, I'm quite disciplined. You know, I like structure. I like repetition. Um, I'm just temperamentally the opposite. <laughs> so it, it, reading your books, I just felt this sense of, oh, it just feels quite functional and practical. And what I'm craving for is sort of existential meaningfulness. You know, that's what motivates me. That this very, this very like, what is the story that we're part of? What is propelling us forwards? You know, questions of, of spirituality, really. And then I read your most recent book and it was like, oh, hello, something, something is, and you, feel free to push back on this because it, you, you may well narrate what's happened very differently, but it felt to me, on, what I wrote down in my notes was a spiritual turn, that this sense of wrestling with mortality and um, wrestling with what does it mean to be in the present? What does it mean to savor? What does it mean to pay attention? You know, and even towards the end of the book, spirit language comes in, soul language comes in. And I may have kind of missed it in your earlier work. I haven't read every single word you've ever written. Um, but as a kind of thesis, how, how does that sit with you? Does it feel to you like there's some something, something on the move, something changing, or maybe that just happens with every book you write? Well, that is such an interesting observation. Um, I I feel like that element, and it's funny because you know my, my books are sort of what is uh, what, what I show to other people, but sometimes what it's hard for me to know kind of what is seen by others and what's just like racketing around in my head. Mm-hmm. Um, so to me, the, those kinds of concerns feel very present. Um, like, you know, St. Therese of Lisieux, you know, like I just think about her all the time. And so I, maybe I feel like I'm thinking Could, about this. Do those you mind things. if I interrupt you? Can you say more about her and oh. that? What do you mean? Oh, oh, okay. So St. Therese of Lisieux is, um, sort of my spiritual teacher, you know, which is a question I always say to people like, you know, who's your spiritual teacher? Very much a question you're along your line. Um, so I came across St. Ther- I'm not Catholic. Um, and for people who don't know, St. Therese um, is a, a saint in the Catholic church. She's also a doctor of the church. So she's in a, co- like a, she's in a, a category of sort of super saints. She died very young at the age of 23. She spent much of her life in a cloistered convent. Um, and um, when she was a nun, her biological sister was her mother in the convent, sort of in the in the structure of the convent, and so, you know, under discipline, uh, this sister mother asked Therese to write the story of her her spiritual life, and so Therese did, and this is this book called Story of a Soul, which is her spiritual memoir. And again, she died at age twenty three, um, in France, of tuberculosis. And this book, I mean, I have read it, I don't know, five times, seven times. I've read like 15 biographies of Therese. I have a book of her, the photographs that were taken of her. 
Um, I'm thinking maybe I'll go visit uh, Lizia and see there's, you know, all of her relics and all this stuff. And I found my way to her in a very odd way. Thomas Merton, um, who's very uh, misanthropic, I would say, um, or, or, and a very complicated person. I've gone deep into Thomas Merton as well. He mentioned Story of a Soul and he mentioned Therese, St. Therese in kind of a very reverential way. And I'm like, how is it that Thomas Merton, given who he is, is talking about... Um, uh, St. Therese in this way. And what's funny, I, I really, this memoir is not something that it will appeal to everyone, but it's, it's so profound. Uh, I get something different from it every time I read it. She's very funny, which you don't think of a saint as like having a good sense of humor. Um, and so, you know, I think about it, um, I, you know, it just sort of was running through my head all the time. I choose all, or when one loves, one does not calculate or, you know, the lily and the rose versus the violet. And um, uh, yeah, so, I, you know, so to me, that's very apparent, um, it, kind of in my head. But I think that you're right in my writing, um, maybe that, that isn't always as apparent. Um, and, and yeah, maybe it did come through more. I mean, I'm getting older, and I think as you get older, you're just naturally thinking more about mortality and the ends of things and... Uh, and uh, so maybe that also brought it forth. But that's interesting that you perceived it to be a shift. It didn't, it didn't feel that way to me, but that's, now I want to go back and reflect on that. That's very interesting. Hi, I wondered if I could ask for your help. You may have noticed that we've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes to make this channel more beautiful, more enriching, more thought-provoking and more life-giving. But 87% of you watching on this channel are not yet subscribed. So I wondered if you would just hit the little subscribe button. It means that you'll get these really thoughtful conversations in your feed and it will also help other people find us. Thanks very much. Yeah, even, even as the book goes on, it felt like a deepening into something. And we all read what we're looking for, right? So I have this particular set of lenses where I'm very attuned to people wrestling metaphysically or with their spirituality or these, these kind of depth questions. So our, those will always kind of stand out on the page yes. to me. But yes. I think also it's because, frankly, it's because of, we come to each other with these stories, don't we? We come with these preconceptions. And I think I had put your work in the kind of atomic habits, small changes mm. box, all of which is great and really useful for people. But at the edges of which I have always found a bit off-puttingly male, sure. frankly, and it's sort of underlying anthropology seeming to sort of see a human being as a machine that if we can just, if we can just oil the right bits and fix the right sure. bits and tweak the right bits and optimize and yes. that we will be able to be a sort of, you know, um, transhumanist. <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, efficiency yes. machine. Yes, yes. And honestly, I think it probably was never there in your work, but it, it, the, the, the process of talking to people different from myself means, again, I'm confronted with my prejudices. And that was one of my prejudices. And then particularly this last book, can I just read you a little bit that I thought was so beautiful? Oh, you well, kind I of, would love that. Yeah. It, um, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's in between these very, as I said, and it's not, it's not to denigrate the, the ordinary. I think you're, that you're making a very profound point that when we pay attention to the ordinary, we can hallow our lives. And it's, you know, it's, it's in between you know, suggestions to think about your paint colors and really, really smell a candle and think about what music you need, these very everyday applicable things. But then you have this meditation on a traffic cone. Oh, yeah. Where you say right at the end, you know, and the impressions that rose into my mind as I gazed at that cone were just as intense as the sensations of my body. In this moment, I felt a sudden affection towards the people around me with a tenderness that expanded to encircle the world. All those people with all their faces and songs and jokes and luck. I was wide awake with so much sensation pouring in that I felt electrified by it. Then with a fresh gust of wind, rain began to fall, the light from the sky darkened and the traffic cone faded back into an ordinary street object. The moment passed, but it lives again now and will again and will forever for as long, or at least for as long as I live. Look, 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 stretch out your hand. And you saying you're reading Therese of Lazier makes that make much more sense. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, no, and, and it is funny because I am always groping toward the transcendent through the practical. Um, because I think that one thing that that is an obstacle for people's sort of transcendent connection is that they are so weighed down by things that to me, in my ordinary, my orderly rigid way, I'm like, you can get rid of that. You can deal with that. If you would get enough sleep, you would, you would be laughing more if you would, you know? Uh, and so I, I, I think I always am like, let's clear, let's get, let's get the things that are, that are standing in our way out of our way. And then we can go, um, we can get to higher places because I think people just feel weighed down by all these, this, like this stuff that is just, it's inconsequential and yet it's, it's an obstacle. Um, so, uh, oh, I'm so glad you love you, you, that, that spoke to you because that was one of the most profound moments of my life, certainly. And writing that was one of the, the sort of one of the most, um, you know, gratifying, creative undertakings. Um, it took me a long time to write that, as you can imagine, to say exactly what I wanted to say. And I felt that I did say exactly what I wanted to say. So I'm so pleased that it resonated with you. Yeah, I could see it on your face, the being being back there as you heard it. Yes. Did it Does it feel more vulnerable and exposing to write about those kind of transcendent things? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, more than the practical things, yes. Yeah, but it's yeah. it's funny though, but I take such great delight in like the five, you know, the five tastes of of Heinz ketchup, you know, that I do feel like there's sort of a delight in that too. Um, but yes, it does feel much less vulnerable for sure. Yeah. Um, one of the people that I had on uh, last series is called Catherine May, who wrote a book called Wintering. Yes. Um, who is just a very delightful, thoughtful, wonderful woman who in, in some way is also just thinking aloud about what a good life looks like. What is wisdom? You know, how do we, how do we pay attention to the world around us? Her most recent book's called Enchantment, which th they resonate with each other in some ways because they are just this sense of, there's a, there's, a prayer, there's a prayer I pray a lot, which is God help me receive the gifts I've already been given. Yes. Well, that's why I wrote The Happiness Project. Yes. Well, let's say more about that. And then I will say what I was going to say about Catherine May. Oh, yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, no. no, I mean, one of the written, but one of the main reasons that I wrote The Happiness Project is I'm like, I don't have enough gratitude for what I already have. Um, and so I really wanted to, you know, uh, not be distracted by just sort of like the, 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 the minor inconsequential troubles of every day and really, and really have that, that deep appreciation for everything that I, that I had. Yeah. Um, because it's, it's easy to lose, it's easy to lose touch with that. Um, I find at least for me, um, yeah. which is why I have to write books like this <laughs> to, it's like as a discipline to, you know, to stay focused on it. Yes. yes. But what were you saying about Catherine May? Yes. Yeah. It's hedonic adaptation, isn't it? I think it's all yeah. of us. The, there's a it's terrible, terrible, or it's just, it is the all. negativity bias where you're more, you're more focused on like what's going wrong or you're thinking about your to-do list and you know, this future focus and yeah, this negativity yeah. focus for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the Catherine May and I reflected and, and another person that's been a guest on the podcast and I'm in conversation with is called, is Oliver Berkman, who's written a book. Oh, I, I love Oliver Berkman. Yes. Isn't he amazing? 4,000 yes. Weeks. I'm going to be doing yes. some stuff with him for my book that I've got coming out in May because we're both sort of obsessed with what wisdom means now in this world. But both of them have found themselves in this strange position of, 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 of sort of guru adjacent. Yes. That they've written these books, which similar to you are really about their own you know, what do I think wisdom looks like? What, I, what do I think? How do we do, treat time? How do I deal with hard times? How do I get enchant, enchantment in my life? But having written about them so powerfully and beautifully and intelligently, they now have lots of people coming to them and saying, you know, teach us, teach us what does it mean to live a, a life? And, 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 and you know, t teach us, Gretchen, what does it mean to live a happy life? What does happiness look like? And uh, Catherine and I joked about a sort of seminary for accidental spiritual gurus because <laughs> that is no one, hilarious. Yes. I think, I think that's needed because in a time when actually religious affiliation is going down, there's a very, there's some good reasons to be skeptical about traditional religious leaders, traditional forms of authority in all kinds, actually. The people that use, we used to follow and used to teach us, for some good reasons and some bad reasons, fewer people access them. And so we're looking for podcasts and books to teach us wisdom and teach us how to live. And people who write brilliant books can find themselves catapulted into these positions. And so yes. I was reflecting with Catherine that there's no training for that. 
<laughs> that I, I am so on board. The seminary for accidental gurus. I am so on board. I would love stop that. Great gym. Because oh, here's the thing that I wish. I wish that ordin- that there was like an ordinary tradition ritual of blessing. Mm. Because I feel this intense desire to give a blessing, which seems incredibly um, arrogant, you know? And I would think, well, if I was a minister giving a blessing, it wouldn't, it would be, it would be, it would be elevated, but I'm just me. I, but I wish there was a way that an ordinary person, it's like, oh, I'm thinking of you or something like that. But it's like, there, there's, I don't, you, have you read the novel Gilead by Marilyn Robinson? Many, many times. There you go. Okay. Because you know how the main character talks about giving a blessing and lay, putting your hands on someone and blessing them. And I read that and I was like, I so feel this desire to be blessed and to bless in that way. But there's no way outside of a religious context in which that is at all acceptable. But maybe in the seminary of accidental gurus, we can come up with a way to do that because I think people crave it both ways. You know, it's to bless and to be blessed. And it's, it's just, it's one of the things that's, that I, that I feel is missing. Okay. Oh, okay. Sidebar on Gilead. Amazing book. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I think she's maybe the best novelist in the United States today, but yes, yes. And one of the, one of the only ones who has able to written novels that take spirituality and even the deep religious instinct seriously, that makes sense for those who, who, who that is not part of their life or it's not their language. It's one of my deepest frustrations that we don't know how to talk. This, the, these things are beyond words. Our deep longings for transcendence are so hard to put into everyday stories. What a great question. I would love to reflect on novelists who do that. I, like Wendell Berry comes to yeah, mind as yeah. someone who does that to some degree. Yeah. Graham Greene. Uh, yeah, well, for sure. Graham Greene, yeah. absolutely. Uh, it's on one hand, right? Um yeah, well, yeah, that's it. Well, Flannery O'Connor, of course. That's Reading the letters of Flannery O'Connor. Wow. Uh, yeah, I, 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 her, her fiction, something like Wise Blood is so, like, I find it so mind-blowing that I almost can't stand it. I almost can't stand to read her fiction. It's just like, it just is so, it's so charged. Yeah. But reading The Habits of Being, uh, her collection of letters, if you're, if you have to read this, if you have yes. not read le- The Habits of Being, it's so good. Yeah, and it's all yes. about these issues. Because yeah. she's trying to think of how do I address spiritual issues basically for, for unbelievers. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's the, that's the question of my life. Yeah. Um, I, oh, this question, there's so, my, my mind's just gone on nine different directions. So let me take a breath <laughs> um, and say, I, well, on blessing, I am going to send you some, uh, a connection with two, two former guests on the podcast who are, who are friends. One's called Vanessa Sultan and one is called Casper Takail. And they have a podcast oh, yes. called... Sure. Yeah, come across yep. them. So v- Vanessa's Vanessa's whole thing is you don't you you can just bless people that you it doesn't have to be in a religious context. At the end of that podcast, I say right, we're going to pick a character and we're going to bless them, and it really means just we're going to honor them. We're going to honor their courage. We're going to honor their bravery. We're going to honor their kindness. We're going to whatever it is that we're seeing in them that we want more of in the world. We are going to honor that, and we're going to use the language of blessing to do it. So I'm like, let's just do it. Let's bless each other. <laughs> let's just you know t- take that mantle. Um, and, and move into it. And maybe, maybe, maybe that's your next book. Maybe you can <laughs> lead us into um, blessing in the world. But I wanted yeah. to kind of land us in attention as, as yeah. this theme that is so key in the five senses and is so key, I think, in what makes a life well lived. And I have a particular interest um, because the fully alive book that I have coming about is loosely structured around the seven deadly sins and the mm-hmm. sin of acedia, yes. uh, which is, um, yeah. you, you will know well, but is, is the, we usually translate that Latin word as sloth, but it actually means something much more like, yes. well, many things, but yes. distraction, apathy, listlessness, joylessness, failing to attend to the important things of life. With kind of a hopelessness. Yeah. Uh, uh, I always think of it as having kind of an, an element of hopelessness to it. Yeah, yeah. It's so rich. It's like shalom, right? You can't, it, it sort of is peace, but also not just peace. It's something that much bigger than English can hold. Yes. Um, but I, I was thinking about Acedia a lot reading your book because 
I start with a sin and then say, what's the opposite? You know, what, what are we moving to? What are we wanting to move away from? A CD or what, what are we wanting to move towards? Attention and attention to the things we want to define our lives. You know, our deep values, your personal commandments, maybe. Mm-hmm. Could you say a bit about attention as a habit um, or a practice? And, and there's loads on this in your book, but what are the things that you are holding most dear to you um, about attention that you would you would love other people to, to learn about in this incredibly contested life that we live where attention is a very scarce commodity and we absolutely have to fight for it? Yes. And, and I feel like I, I'm, I'm prey to all the distractions that we all are. And I just think just naturally in my own nature, I'm very up in my head. And so I'll be walking on a beach during the sunset and I'll be so busy, like rewriting a paragraph in my, in my mind that I just, I just complete, and I can focus very deeply, which is a strength, but also weakness because I can just, bl- I just, all of that gets blocked out and I'm just, you know, focused on my head. And so, you know, there's many practices that people use to try to pay more attention. And But for me, I really found that the, like, really trying to, to pay attention to the five senses because that is what is happening right now. And often when I pay attention to my five senses, then I really, I'm, I engage more deeply in what's happening around me. And, and there have been sort of moments um, where this became clear to me. Like I remember many, many years ago when my daughter was 10 years old or something, we walked into a department store and she said, oh, I love that department store smell. And at that time I thought, wow, I never noticed that a department store has a particular smell. But of course, just like a hardware store has a very particular smell or a wine shop has a very particular smell or different, you know, you're standing in front of the produce in a grocery store and that has a very particular smell. And, um, but I just never noticed it. And so I, the, I, and I think there are a lot of ways that people pay attention, but for me, it's just, it's like, what does it smell? What do I see? What do, what do I hear? How do things feel? Like now I'm much more like I'll reach out and touch a lot of textures that I used, not, I used to not do just because that is a way that I am able to be like, this is happening right now. Let me pay attention. I don't want to pass through this unnoticed. Um, and and it's hard. I mean, I, I still have to really remind myself to do that every single day because I just start drifting you know, into my, in, just into my, you know, inner chatter. Um, one of the things that I did for the book, but I still do now because I love it so much as a practice in, of attention is I, I'm incredibly fortunate that I live within walking distance of the Metropolitan Museum. And so I go every day that it's open. And this for me is always a, reminds me, like, come back to the present, what's happening right now, really look, really listen. Um, and that's a way to kind of, let my mind off the leash and just explore and play, but also stay in the moment. Look, you know, what's changing. Um, the Metropolitan Museum changes all the time. I, when I went rarely, I thought it was always the same. Now I realize it's changing all the time. Um, so for me, that ha- that is a really uh, kind of grounded, accessible way to stay, to pay attention to the moment. Because I think that's an idea that many people say that they want, but it's very hard to put it into practice because it's an abstract idea mm-hmm. and we're constantly being pulled out of the moment. Yes, and I, I, it was really beautiful listening to you, listening in to your writing about that practice, the so, sort of almost daily pilgrimage to, yes. to see beautiful things, but to, to be looking for different things every yes. day, um, to, to, to be hallowing that, that practice. And it, it, it made me think about the kind of monastic, I live in a sort of very small intentional community that draws a lot on monastic thinking. And the phrase that's often used in monastic circles and, and the Jesuits use, use it a lot, which is no formation without repetition. Yes. And I think that we're so allergic to repetition in general, in our culture, I am naturally very allergic to it because we mm. think it's sort of scarcity and, and, and we get bored easily. You know, you talk about smell blindness, but that, that that message of actually it takes a long time for things to change you and the commitment to things over time yes. um, is the way we live our values, is the way we live the kind of life we want to live. I know it probably comes easier for you than for a lot of people, but you have done a lot of research into how people are motivated. For those of us who do find repetition as a way of training our attention difficult, what might help? Um, wait, have you taken the four tendencies quiz? Cause I'm wondering if you're a rebel. I, I have taken it a while ago, but 
I'm, I'm the person that needs very strong internal motivation and is terrible with external motivation. What's that one? Uh, that could be question or that could be rebel. So if yeah. somebody told you to do something, would you say, why should I do it? Or would you say, you can't tell me what to do? What would be your-, I would, your say, I would say why. I would okay. say, is it in line with my values? Is it going to help me become the kind of person the world needs? I'm totally up for it. Otherwise, absolutely no, I can't be bothered. Um, but you really value spontaneity and you don't like habits, right? Yes. Although I'm in a long period of soul work of- I've ch- I think I've, I think I am actively trying to change the bit in me that is a resistance resistant to repetition because I am convinced there is no formation without repetition. But uh, I think that you're a rebel. Okay. So take the quiz and see if you're a rebel. Thomas okay, Merton, read the journals of Thomas Merton because yes, he I is love Merton. he's a rebel. But he was a difficult, complicated guy, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. I don't love all of him, but right. I love I love his. But I love he, his core. He. Well, what was his core? But anyway, he's yeah. a rebel yeah. who's very drawn. Obviously, he was a Cistercian monk or what, yeah. what, what was his order? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, that's a sidebar. Um, uh, but I, yes, I think that, but if you're a person who values what can be gained through repetition, but you sort of resist repetition, I think the thing is, how could you achieve the same aim in a way that's right for you? So maybe you would say something like, well, for me, the repetition is going to be that I go for a 20 minute walk every day and really pay attention to what I see, but I'm going to go, I'm going to go different places every day. And the repetition comes from the repeated practice, but you, you make it feel more interesting to yourself or more enticing by saying like, I'm going to do this to explore my neighborhood and in this way, or I'll, I'll do it at different times of the day. So it will be a different experience because for me, things become more interesting as they are exactly repeated. But I think you're exactly right that for some people that feels very confining and also sort of like a wasted opportunity. Like the world is so rich. Why would you do the same thing over and over and over again when there's so many things that you're not tapping into, which is also completely valid. And so I think that it, I, I really think that there is no one right way and there is no one best way and that we all have to find the way that's right for us. And so you can think about an aim and we can agree on an aim, but find, have very different paths to, to arrive at that aim because people are just very, very different in their nature and their values. To me, the repetition is extraordinarily appealing and engaging, but I can mm-hmm. see that why for some people that would be off-putting. I think my final question for you, Gretchen, is, is happiness still your theme or is it evolving? Well, I think my theme has always been human nature. That's my mm-hmm. overarching theme. Even writing a biography of Winston Churchill, like he's such a gigantic figure that you can see human nature more easily just because it's it's on such a giant scale. Um, so I think, uh, so happiness is uh, one of the aspects of human nature that is most interesting to me. And then everything comes off of that. But I I really feel like when, when I'm talking about happiness, it's like, are you living the life that you want to live? Are you doing everything within your nature and your circumstances and your possibilities to have the life that you would like to have, whatever that means for you. And so, um, and, and just exploring human nature and what that looks like for different people. So I think that is still my my theme, and I always write about myself because I'm like, it's hard enough to know myself. It's, it's, I use myself as sort of the data point. I find that, it's, speaking of the accidental gurus, I find that it's very easy to give advice to other people. Um, and I know exactly what advice to give to other people. But then when I try to take that advice myself, I often find that it is, it's more complicated than I thought. No. And so I, I, I can tell from what people write. I'm like, have you tried to take this advice? Because I think many gurus do not try to take their own advice. Um, there are very, there are many unprincipled gurus and many, many gurus who do not, who don't even seem to occur to them to try to practice what they preach. Because when you try to actually do it, it turns out to be, turns out to be pretty complicated, I find. So I always, I always test it out on myself and the people around me to see what, what, what I get. Yeah. That, that would maybe be module one of the yeah. uh, Seminary of Accidental yeah. Gurus. Yes, the Seminary of Accidental Gurus. <laughs> Gretchen Rubin, I have so enjoyed speaking to you for this special Fully Alive series of the Sacred Podcast. Thank you so much for your time and your wisdom. Thank you so much. I so enjoyed our conversation. Well, I really enjoyed that. And um, as I alluded to with Gretchen, because I try and be honest about these things. 
I didn't know that I was going to enjoy it as much as I did. And regular listeners will know that um, this is a fairly common thing for me, that some guests, I kind of know how we're going to go deep and, and have new ter- territory to explore. And some guests, I'm not quite sure how we're going to get there or if they're going to be willing to meet me with my kind of nerdy, unstructured reflections. Um, and Gretchen really did. What a sweetheart. What a, um, what a lot going on that I didn't know about until I really got into that most recent book. And she said fully aliveness to her was being present in the moment. And uh, I think that's a really common thing for people. And it gets taught a lot in, in wisdom traditions, um, in these rigorous spiritual paths, that there's a real piece of soul work for us to learn, which is not living in the past, not living in the present, uh, not living in the future, but living in the now. You know, in my tradition, it's the phrase that's used, Jesus says, each day has enough trouble of its own. You know, <laughs> uh, be, there is enough, there is enough bread. Like, you know, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, receive the gift of this day. Receive the gift of this life and this moment. Um, and that sense of connection with ourselves in the moment, I think, is, is really key for a lot of us in this puzzle about what helps us feel fully alive. Deep value of integrity and authenticity, you know, that self-knowledge as a way of um, navigating life. Love talking to her about children's books. Really loved that she was honest about the fact that actually children's books are quite didactic. They often are like, here is a good life. Here is not a good life. You know, that, that muddiness and moral complexity, which I think we do also need and crave in great art, but that we also need exemplars. We need stories that w- can help us frame um, the kind of lives we want to live and our own values. And children's literature is often really, really good at that. Um, I loved that she said, you know, the key to happiness is these two things, relationships and self-knowledge. And uh, I don't think that they're opposite that one focuses us in and one focuses us out because I think wisdom and a good life needs some of both. But that actually the more we know ourselves, the more we can be in healthy relationships. The more we're in healthy relationships, the more we can know ourselves. That those things um, are interdependent. Really didn't see it coming. St. Therese of Lisieux as a spiritual teacher. Brilliant. Makes me want to go and read everything she's written. And also, I love Thomas Merton, but I'm no expert. And it made me go, huh, probably need to dig a bit deeper into Thomas Merton rather than just like, you know, (laughs) extracting all the quotes that I already agree with. Um, Yeah, this this theme of attention and acedia and the practices that we need, you know, in 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 the chapter in the book, I'm reflecting on my desperate attempt not to be pinging around like a pinball, distracted by everything, but to be like a plant, to be someone whose roots go down deep into love is growing steadily towards life, life lifefulness. And how I actually find the idea of trellis really helpful, that practices and rituals and rhythms, ideally collective ones, which is why I live in a a small intentional community, um, are essential because I'm just such a flippy digibit. I am such a pinball. I'm like, bing, 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 bing. Um, I don't have the temperament that's naturally quite disciplined and likes repetition, like I think Gretchen does. Um, But even so, it's hard to know whether she already liked it and therefore she finds these practices come easily to her, like going to the Met for a year every day or um, some of the other practices she's talked about elsewhere. Or being someone who's adopted those practices has actually created in her a more disciplined and focused person who can pay attention to what's important. Hard to pull those things apart. And we landed again on this seminary for accidental gurus, which I have to avoid trying to talk to everybody about, but I actually wonder if there's a real thing here um, because we're so desperate for wisdom and uh, people finding it in community context is really difficult. I think that that's, a, that's the bigger problem to fix, actually, rather than looking to individuals f- from our individual actual media consumption. And, you know, I've written a book and have a podcast, so I'm not, not complicit. Um, but the, the big question for us about wise lives and fully aliveness is where, where's the collective? Where's the community? Who am I in relationship with where I can be growing in the same direction, growing together? Um, but I'm sure we'll come back to that in our episode on pride, which is all about individualism and community. Meanwhile, 
Thank you so much for listening to this special Fully Alive episode of The Sacred. My name is Elizabeth Oldfield, and The Sacred is a project of the think tank Theos, which does loads of other fascinating work, events. We have a sister podcast called Reading Our Times. Would love you to go and check that out. Our production team, our wonderful production team, are Daniel Turner, Fiona Hanscom, and Amari Yagandran. We are edited by Drew Hawley. Our music is by Luke Stanley, with lyrics by Lizzie Harvey. We'll be coming back next week to reflect on another of the seven deadly sins through the lens of an interview with a guest. I look forward to speaking to you then.